Good morning. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. And today we're going to look at the topic cleaning house. Now, this topic is not probably the most fascinating or encouraging in some respects of the topics of the Bible, but it's part of who God is and it's part of God's plan for not just our lives, but for this planet that we live on. The fact that he's a God of grace, yes, but he's also a God of judgment, a God whose patience is not infinite. And there comes a time when God says enough is enough. Now, chapter 9 of 2 Kings deals with God's patience running out with the family of this man Ahab. And you're going to see God deal with his son and his grandson and his wife and God's going to clean up the mess that they made. And God's going to judge them in a very public and also a very horrific manner to emphasize his anger against their sin and what they have done. Now, 20 years have passed, roughly, since Ahab and Jezebel, in 1 Kings chapter 21, murdered a man called Naboth, a godly man, and stole his vineyard and his inheritance, and had him murdered in a very horrific way in the nation of Israel. God had warned that he was going to judge this family for their terrible murder and their terrible idolatry. Now, Ahab has already been dealt with. He was killed by an arrow in battle, guided like an exorcet missile by God, came in and took him out. Jezebel is still on the throne. She's still certainly the power behind the throne of her son Jehor Joram or Jehoram. She's an older woman now. She's a woman that's used to getting her way. Maybe she even thinks that Elijah's prophecy of judgment, she has escaped it, that the gods that she worshiped, Baal, are more powerful than the gods of Israel to protect her. She may well have been uh, known to have demonic powers. I, I suspect when you read the story, she gives the impression of being so devoted to her cult of devil worship that she probably is seen as some type of white witch. And people are afraid of her, intimidated by her. Maybe she even, in her own delusion, thinks that the, her God is too strong for her to be dealt with. Maybe there are many people in the nation after 20 years uh, with Elijah having gone home to glory, said, well, the prophesied judgment didn't come true. Elijah's no longer here, but Jezebel is here, and she's got away with it. Well, this chapter is going to reveal that she didn't get away with it, that God is going to deal with her in his time and in his way. Now, God's instrument of judgment upon the house of Ahab and the family of Ahab is a man called Jehu. Now, Jehu is not a particularly pleasant individual. He's not someone you invite around for tea or to teach Sunday school in your church. He's a ruthless, tough, bloodthirsty individual himself. Although he has a good name, the name Jehu means Jehovah is he, Jehovah is God, or Jehovah is the one. And Jehu was a commander in the northern kingdom's armies. He, he's a commander of the family of Ahab in their army. God's going to use him to destroy and wipe out the whole family circle of this man, Ahab, and his extended family. Now, the story begins in 2 Kings chapter 9 with Elisha, the prophet, who's now an old man himself, calling one of his student prophets to go to a place where Jehu is in Ramoth Gilead, and we'll put it up on the map for you to see roughly the distances. And he's to go to Ramoth Gilead and anoint Jehu there with oil. Now, no other king in the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes rebel kingdom, was anointed by oil by God, only Jehu. Probably this is to signify God's power, God's approval on what he has done and to maybe also indicate that he's following in the Davidic tradition of the kingdom of Judah because he's chosen by God to 
do this particular role. So he's anointed by oil and he's told, when you get there, look out for Jehu, verse 2, the son of Nimshi. Go in, make him arise from among his brethren and carry him to an inner room. So take him away from all the other commanders of the army. Take him privately, then take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say these words. Verse 3, thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. Now, Elisha's an old man at this point. Maybe he's too old to go on this long journey. And he sends one of his young men to dash down there because God has revealed this is the moment. And Jehu's the man for the moment. And go there, take Jehu privately from all the other military commanders of the armed forces, anoint him with oil and tell him God has spoken and God has chosen you and you are to be the next king of the northern kingdom. But then you're to flee. Now, we don't know why he's to flee. Maybe it's to indicate that the matter now is a matter of urgency because this is a perilous state for Jehu to be in, to be anointed a rival king uh, to the family of Ahab. And he's going to have to act quickly and with great strength and determination to wipe out such an evil legacy and an evil dynasty, particularly with Jezebel still hanging around. And that's what he does. Verse 4, the young man goes there to Ramoth Gilead. He calls Jehu aside and when he gets Jehu aside in verse 6, he says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of, is of the Lord, even Ozo over Israel. And his first task as a new king is, Thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. So he's told that his role, Jehu, is to wipe out the whole dynasty of Ahab. And it's because of their murderous hatred for the prophets of God, because of the evil they've done. God saw it, God heard it, and now God is going to clean house in judgment to deal with it. Now, many of these prophets died 20, maybe 30 years before. People may ask, well, why didn't God deal with Jezebel and Ahab at that time? Well, God deals with every sinner in his time and in his way. Just because you think he should do it in the past or 20 years before doesn't mean God sees things that way. He, he has, his ways are higher than our ways, he tells us. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I decide. That's why I'm God. I know better the right time to deal with sinners. And he says in verse 9, I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. These were two rival dynasties that were obliterated by God, wiped out by God previously for their sins in the rebel kingdom of Israel. And he says in verse 10, The dog shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Now, this final prophecy, this final command, is linked to a prophecy from 1 Kings chapter 21 because it says in verse 23 of 1 Kings 21, And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. So this was a prophecy, a prophecy of judgment, a promise of judgment. 20 years previously by God. And now this unnamed young prophet, student prophet, turns up at Jehu's residence with this oil and this message from God. And the message is simply this, now is the time for God's prophecy to come true. Now, Jehu, he's questioned then after this man leaves. Because in verse 11, when Jehu comes out of this room, the other military commanders, his colleagues, they say to him, what's going on? Well, what's this guy here? This strange young man turned up with this oil and he asked to speak to you in private. What, what was he saying to you? And Jehu tries to sort of shake it off. And he said, you know the man and his communication. In other words, he seems to be saying, well, this guy's not 100%. He's not the full shilling, as we would say over here. He's a bit crazy. 
bit cuckoo. That doesn't fool these military men. They know that a prophet, maybe they knew this man was from Elisha's school of the prophets, and they knew of Elisha's reputation, and they knew that anointing oil was a significant thing, and what it represented as a symbol. And they said to Jehu in verse 12, is it, it is false. Tell us. In other words, they said, we don't believe you, Jehu. You're trying to bluff us. Tell us the truth. Be serious here. Why was he really there? And then Jehu says, thus and thus spake he to me, saying, thus saith the Lord, and you see the word Lord's in capitals there, indicating that's Jehovah in the Hebrew. Thus saith Jehovah, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Now, this is a very critical moment for Jehu, because what he is declaring is rebellion, treason. He, this is a military coup that he's seeking to lead, to overthrow the king of Israel and Jezebel and their family. Now, will these men follow him or turn against him? Remember, these men are sworn to follow the leadership of the true king of Israel, Ahab's family. And he has bluffed them or tried to bluff them, and now he's told them the truth. Now, to his credit, and I like this about Jehu in this instance, when he speaks to them in verse 12, he doesn't say to them, I'm going to be king, and if you follow me, I'll give you this reward or that reward or that position. He simply says, thus saith Jehovah, I have made you. I have anointed you to become king. He simply states to them the bare promise and command of Almighty God. And you know, God honors his faith because verse 13 says, Then they hasted and took every man his garment and put it onto him on the top of the stairs and blew a trumpet and saying, Jehu is king. Immediately all the other commanders swear an oath of allegiance to Jehu and say, We want this man to be king. We recognize this man as king. But now, having united the army behind him, Jehu has just as difficult a task to face because he now has to destroy the king with his army or whatever soldiers he has, which is about 40 miles away in a place called Jezreel. So Jehu has to get from Ramoth Gilead to Jezreel and he has to surround this king Joram, and then deal with Jezebel, and then the grandson Ahaziah, who's also the king of Judah, as well as the grandson of Ahab. It's a little bit complicated, but because of the intermarriage, Ahaziah is on the throne of Judah, but he's also the grandson of Ahab. And he has to deal with these men, and he has to deal with it quickly before they get a chance to hear of his rebellion and start to raise armies uh, to oppose him. So Jehu immediately makes haste and heads the 40 miles to, from Ramoth Gilead down to a place called Jezreel. And providentially, King Joram is there and he's vulnerable because his army is away at Ramoth Gilead fighting a battle. He only has a small group of soldiers with him in Jezreel and he's wounded. He's recovering from serious wounds that he was given in a battle with the Syrians. So he's vulnerable, he's weak. This is the moment. God has, you can see the hand of God, the finger of God working behind the scenes, ordaining these circumstances. And as Jehu heads there with his soldiers, King Joram and his men that are with him are looking out from their little fort. And they're wondering, who's coming? Is it a friend? Is it a foe? And then some of the men recognize Jehu. And as they said, Jehu, they said to the king, they says, it looks like Jehu. It looks like Jehu. He's driving like the driving of Jehu in verse 20. Obviously, Jehu was known for his speedy uh, travel and how he was a great racer with the horses and the chariots. He was so good and so recognizable that the men from a distance could recognize this, is, this has to be Jehu. No other man can race like he, man, he can. And King Joram makes a critical decision at this moment. He decides to send messengers. And as the messengers meet the Jehu coming, they say, is it peace? 
Are you coming with a message of peace for the king? Is it good news? And Jehu doesn't reply, save for saying to them, what hast thou to do with peace? Gives an ambiguous answer. And then Joram in verse 21 makes a fatal decision. He decides that he can trust Jehu. Remember, Jehu was up in Ramoth Gilead fighting his battle. And Joram decides, I'll go and ride out to meet him. Maybe he's thinking in case it's bad news. Maybe there's something I don't want the others to hear. And he decides to go out with Ahaziah, his cousin, who's also the grandson of Ahab, the king of Judah. And the two of them decide to go out and meet this guy Jehu. He can be trusted. Big mistake. Fatal mistake. And as they make their way to Jehu, King Joram sees him and shouts to him in verse 22, and he says, Is it peace, Jehu? Now, we don't know what he's saying. Is it peace between you and me? Or is he saying, Is it peace for my kingdom that we have overcome our enemies in battle, the one that Jehu and the other commanders were fighting when Joram was resting from his wounds, recovering from his wounds? We just don't know. He just says, Is it peace? And Joram's, or Jehu's answer makes it very clear. He's made a fatal mistake about the motivations and motives of Jehu. Because in verse 22, Jehu answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. Suddenly Jehu reveals, I'm not on your side. I'm come to deal with the vile sins of your family. And what he's saying with those words is that Jezebel has done much wickedness, spiritual wickedness, with her idolatry and her witchcraft and her hatred of God's word. And Jehu offers no compromise. He doesn't say to them, well, if you go into exile in Zidon, where Jezebel's family come from, the, the neighboring kingdom, then we'll just move on. No, he straight away, he lets him know. And Joram immediately picks up What's going on in verse 23? Too late, he cries to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. Jehu's coming, not as a friend, but as a foe. I've been betrayed. And before he can speak again, Jehu, verse 24, drew a bow with his full strength. Now, you may have seen the little stories or watched the, the old films of the cowboys and Indians, and you see these, sometimes you see these little bows and arrows, and kids have their own, and you think that, well, that's, just a little, a little bit of a string you pull back and fire. No, these would have been great bows. It would have uh, taken a full-grown, powerful man to pull it right back, and there'd be incredible tension on it. And when it would be released by a man like Jehu, it would go like a missile. And if it hit a person, it would go right through a person, maybe go through two or three people. There'd be so much power behind the arrow. And Jehu drew a bow, and God, no doubt, is guiding, directing, that arrow, just like the one that killed Ahab, and it goes right through the heart of this man, Joram, and he dies dead in his chariot. What does Jehu do? Jehu suddenly grasps fully the significance of what's just happened because they met each other, we're told in verse 21, at the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. Suddenly, Jehu remembers the prophecy of God through Elijah in, in 1 Kings chapter 21. And he says to his captain, Bidkar, his assistant, take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab, his father, the Lord, laid this burden upon, it, upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, saith the Lord, and I will requite thee in this plat or this place, saith the Lord, now, therefore, take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. Jehu says, this is God's word. We're doing God's work, fulfilling God's promise. And he says, to emphasize that in a very symbolic way, he says, take the body of Joram and throw it into the portion of Naboth's vineyard that was stolen by Ahab and Jezebel, according as God's promise has been. But having dealt with one evildoer, he now deals with the next one. Because God had sworn 
that the whole dynasty of Ahab would be wiped out. And there's a man there on holidays called Ahaziah, the king of Judah. And unfortunately for him, he's also a wicked man. Unfortunately for him, he took a holiday at the wrong time. And unfortunately for him, he's the grandson of Ahab. So under the promise of judgment of the house of Ahab, of the house of Ahab he falls within that. And Jehu says to his men, smite him, verse 27. And they did so at the going up to Gur, which is by Ebel Liam. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. Now, if you want to read the full story of what happened to Ahaziah, you'll discover in 2 Chronicles 22, verse 8 to 9, that he got away, he was wounded, and then he was brought back and was slain, exactly where God said he would be put to death. But they carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in the graves of the royal family because he was from the line of David. Ahaziah has now been dealt with. So we have had Ahab, 20, 20, some years before, maybe more than 10 years before, dealt with. We now have Joram, wiped out by God. Now we have the grandson, Ahaziah, another wicked man. And there's one more big personality that has to be dealt with by God, a woman called Jezebel, one of the most wicked women who has ever lived, a symbol of wickedness. In fact, her name is used as a symbol of wickedness in books like the book of Revelation. Now, Jezebel, she's at the summer palace in Jezreel. This is where it all started, the incident with Naboth. This is where they plotted to steal the vineyard of Naboth, to turn it into a herb garden for themselves. This is where they executed their plot against the godly Naboth. And Jehu heads down to Jezreel. Of course, word gets back to Jezebel that her son is dead and that Jehu's on his way. Now, what will she do? Will she submit to the will of God? Of course not. Will she seek to brazen it out? Will she seek to intimidate? Of course she will. And we're told she got herself ready by painting her face and tired her head. In other words, she did herself up with as much glamour and beauty. Now, she's an older lady now, but she, she used all her magic potions and all her skincare products to make herself look like a queen. Now, remember, she's the daughter of the Zidonian king. She's the mother of a king. She's the grandmother of another king. She's a woman of prominence and significance. She grew up in royalty. She has been royalty for decades. She knows how to intimidate. And she's going to try to use that to intimidate Jehu and also to try and intimidate any who would follow Jehu. As I said earlier, I suspect from the description here about her witchcrafts by this man, Jehu, that in verse 22, that she almost has the reputation of being a white witch. I don't know if you remember the story of Narnia of the white witch. Well, this is kind of what Jezebel was, I suspect. And certainly she would have had that reputation of being uh, someone deeply involved in occult worship, black magic, dark magic. And maybe that's why people feared to touch her, why she was so powerful in the nation, why Ahab was even afraid of her. And her son was afraid of her, her grandson. And this woman, she's not going to give up without a fight. She's going to use all of her charm, all of her arrogance, all of her experience and witchcraft and dark magic. She's going to use it all to try and destroy Jehu, intimidate Jehu. And when he comes into the city of Jezreel, she says this, had Zimri peace who slew his master. Now, you may say, well, what she's doing, making a statement like that. You notice she doesn't try to negotiate with Jehu. She knows she's a very cunning individual. She knows that things have gone way beyond that, that there's no turning back. It's a fight to the death now. And she quotes a story from scripture, from 1 Kings chapter 16, of a wicked man, Zimri, who was also a commander in the king of Israel's army. And Zimri, if you remember, 
murdered his boss, King Elah. He led a coup against King Elah, just like Jehu is doing. That's what she's implying. She says, remember what happened to Zimri? Because Zimri murdered or assassinated the king, King Elah, the son of Bahasha, made himself king, but he only lasted one week because Omri, who happened to be the father of Ahab, Jezebel's husband, he was then chosen by the people. And he came along and burned the royal palace with Zimri in it, and Zimri died a terrible death. And what Jezebel is saying by citing this incident, had Zimri peace who slew his much, she's saying to Jehu, you're going to be cursed if you come any further. And I think she's also trying to gather public opinion around her because she knows he's very vulnerable in terms of numbers here. He's got the army with him and he's also got momentum with him. And I need to do something to put a, put a doubt in his mind. And certainly I, I need to try and sway the public opinion in Jezreel against him. And she cites Jez this incident with this man Zimri. And she's really hoping that Jehu will be afraid, hoping that even if he's not afraid that he will get no support. She's really challenging him. A wrong move for a guy like Jehu because Jehu takes the challenge and he looks up without negotiating with her and he says, who is on my side? You're saying that like Zimri, I have no friends, that I'm going to be abandoned? He just looks up where she is and he says, who's on my side? And suddenly some eunuchs appear who had been servants of this wicked woman Jezebel, who know all about her wickedness and her ruthlessness, and no doubt hate her for the way she behaves towards them and towards others. And he says to them, throw her down, verse 33. Have no mercy. Just pick her up and throw her out of the window down before me. And these men grab Jezebel, and no doubt with delight, they throw her out the window, and she comes down to earth with a crash, all her makeup ruined, and all the, uh, the arrogance and the pride of her flattened in a very literal and symbolic way as she hits the ground. And then we're told some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. In other words, this guy Jehu, what a man, he's a, as I said, he's a ruthless guy, bloodthirsty individual. He just rode over her with his horses and the chariot backwards and forwards, not just to make her sure she's dead, but to be mock her, to humiliate her, to desecrate her body in the most horrific public way. And really, of course, he's also speaking to everybody else there. If you want to back Jezebel against me, if you don't want to submit to me as a king, I'll do the same to you. That's your fate. That's your destiny. Now, in the culture of the Middle East, the desecration of the body of any individual, particularly a member of the royal family, was a great humiliation, was seen as a fate worse than death. And really God is letting us see and the public see in Jezreel that day that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That when God comes to judge a person, your makeup won't protect you. Your royal position won't protect you. Your black magic won't protect you. Your experience won't protect you. And Jehu's such a tough guy. As I said before, he's not someone you invite around your house for tea and scones. In verse 34, he came in, he did eat and drink. He's not bothered. He's just massacred Ahaziah. He's just massacred the King Joram. He's just in the most horrific way, massacred Jezebel, assassinated her, put her to death. And yet it doesn't bother him in the least. He just comes in and he has a meal, eating and drinking, just gets on with enjoying. And he says to his servants after he'd finished eating the meal, now I suppose go, go and bury her. Maybe he's thinking this will help diplomacy with the Zidonians, where Jezebel comes from, the king of Zidon in the future. Now he's the new king. And he says to her, go, just go and bury her, for she's the king's daughter. Let, let's just do that for the sake of public appearance. But verse 35 tells us, when they went to look for her body to bury her, they found no more of her than the skull and the feet 
and the palms of her hands. Just as God had predicted, the dogs would eat Jezebel. And if you can imagine these wild animals, we think of dogs as beautiful, tame little puppies and uh, friends, not in the Middle Eastern culture. The dogs there were diseased, they were rabid, they were full of all kinds of viruses and diseases, they, they would bite you, uh, they were chased out of the cities and the towns. They went around almost like scavengers. So these were very unclean animals, filthy animals. And for a king's daughter, the king's wife, and the grandmother of a king to be humiliated in such a way that to be eaten by dogs, filthy, diseased animals. And then, of course, these dogs would eat the body, and then uh, through the natural processes, they would defecate out the waste, and Jezebel would be spread, in a sense, all over the countryside, just left ruined. What a terrible judgment that God put upon her life. And she became as the dung of the face of the field in the portion of Jezebel, verse 37. That's, that's, it's, I say it's not a pleasant thought. It's, in fact, it's a disgusting. But it shows that she faced this dreadful, dishonorable death because of what she did. God let it be seen that his finger of judgment and anger was upon her. And verse 36 just emphasizes that. Lest we make the mistake of just reading this story and get caught up in the drama of it and the excitement of it and think about her with her painted features and then this confrontation and almost recoil from the, from the horror of it and forget God, forget God's word. Verse 36 brings it back, and he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel, the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezreel. In other words, in Naboth's vineyard, the portion, the place she stole, the place that she orchestrated the murder of the godly Naboth, God is putting her to death in that place, and her body will be spread, her remains through the dung of the animals, all over that vineyard. Now, let me bring this to a conclusion. Yes, this is somewhat gross. It's horrific. It's not pleasant. But there are parts of the gospel that are not pleasant. There are parts of life that is not pleasant. And this whole story is a reminder to you and I, God is patient, yes, with sinners, but his patience is not forever. And if you don't believe me, just ask Ahab and Jezebel. This story also reminds us of the danger of ungodly associations. Last week we saw how Jehoshaphat made friends with Ahab and all the destruction that came upon the house of Jehoshaphat because of it, all the corruption. And now even we see with the death of Ahaziah, the, not just the corruption, but the consequences, the fatal consequences of being associated with wicked people. And Ahaziah dies a terrible death because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. Why did he end up there? Because of what Jehoshaphat did in making an alliance with this evil man Ahab. But let me also say this before we bring this to a final conclusion. There's also another lesson here. Because when you read the story of what Ahab and Jezebel did in killing the godly Naboth and all his family and taking his vineyard and destroying his reputation, it seems that they got away with it. And particularly in Jezebel's case, it seemed that she got away with it for 20 years. Elijah, who predicted judgment upon her, he had already gone to heaven. And seemingly, she had got away with it. And you know, in life, you're going to meet people like Ahab, like Jezebel, who are going to do wicked things, maybe even to you. And it may appear for many years that they got away with it. We have people today in the world 
who shake their fist at God. And some of them are very powerful people. They're billionaires. They're big tycoons. They're political leaders. They control the big tech companies. They sneer at Christianity. They mock it. They discriminate against it. They say all manner of evil against it. They seek to silence and shut it down. And as you look at them from your perspective, there's a temptation to be intimidated and almost think that they're too powerful, that they've got away with it. Well, the story of Ahab and Jezebel and Naboth and Elijah tell us that really in life, they're just two simple groups. The Ahab and Jezebels and the Elijah and the Naboth. And in the end of life, at the end of this world, you're going to be in one of those two groups. And although it may appear that the Jezebels and the Ahabs is the best group to be in, on the surface, initially, the end of the story reveals that actually the best group to be in is Elijah's group and Naboth's group. Because although they may have lost materially for a few years on earth, in the end, they gained everything. And the ones who in the end lost everything were Ahab and Jezebel. But let me just leave this message this morning with these three very simple lessons for you to take away, and we'll put them on the screen. Here they are. Number one, God deals with every sin and with every sinner. Make no mistake about it. If you want to see exhibit number one of that, just ask Adam and Eve. If you want to see further exhibits of that, ask Pharaoh how to get on rebelling against God. Ask Ahab, ask Jezebel, and you'll discover that in his time and in his way, God deals with every sin and every sinner. Not one is left behind. Not one is ignored. But then the second lesson you learn is God deals with sin in his time and in his way. And I have to admit, this is very frustrating for us. We wish sometimes that God would get on with it. But the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. He's long-suffering. He's patient. Because we forget that the sinners we are watching today and wondering why God doesn't strike them down, those sinners were just like us before we were saved. And if God wasn't patient and long-suffering with us, he would have cut us off. We would have died in our sins, those of us who know Christ. We would have gone to hell, and deservedly so for all of eternity. And the Bible tells us God will deal with sin in his time and his way, but he has a purpose and he has a plan in delaying his judgment. And sometimes it's for our benefit. You know, when the apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, in Acts chapter 9, was breathing out threatenings and slaughterings against the early church. I'm sure there are many there who wanted him to be destroyed by God. I'm sure many of their prayer meetings, they prayed for God to strike this evil Saul of Tarsus down. And as Saul went through, rampaging through the early church, and we're told he dragged women by the hair, he dragged people into jail. We're told he even organized deaths of many of the early Christians. As he was doing that, I'm sure they cried, Lord, bring down judgment upon him. Why do you delay, Lord, your execution of judgment upon this vile, wicked hater of Christianity? And little did they know that the reason that God delayed judging Saul of Tarsus was because God was going to save him. And the man who was their greatest opponent was going to be their greatest advocate and friend. The man who did the most damage to Christianity, was then going to be the one who did the most good for Christianity as the Apostle Paul. So don't try to put God in a box. Don't try to understand everything about God because you won't. He will deal with sin, yes, and every sinner, yes, but he'll deal with it in his time and in his way. But then the third lesson to learn from the story is this, and final one is this, God deals with every sin Perfectly. Perfectly. God knew the right time to take out Ahab. He knew the right time to take out Jezebel. He knew the right time not to take out Saul of Tarsus. You see, God is wiser than us. God knows more than we do. And we as Christians have to simply 
hold on to those three principles and say, Lord, deal with sin, deal with sinners. Yes, but do it your way, in your time, because I know you'll do it perfectly. Imagine if God had answered the cry of the early Christians and taken out Saul of Tarsus. What a blessing the church of Jesus Christ would have missed. If Saul of Tarsus had died in his sin on the road to Damascus and had perished in God's judgment, what a disaster that would have been to the church. How much we would have lost a man who wrote more books of the New Testament than anybody else. What a blessing he then became. So let God deal with sin and sinners in his time and in his way. And you can be sure that he'll do it perfectly. He'll separate the wheat from the chaff in his time and in his way. And of course, as we close, we say this. Isn't God amazing in doing not just his salvation, acts of salvation, but his acts of judgment? As we read this, we have to say to God, only God could do it this way. And to God be the glory, great things that we have done. You know, the world's in turbulence right now. Sin is abounding everywhere. And many Christians are confused. Many Christians are saying, what's happening, Lord? Why are you not dealing here, Lord? Why are you not intervening here, Lord? Let me just say this to you. We're not looking for some human deliverer. We're not looking for a politician or a businessman to get us out of some financial problem, to save us, to have a great reset. No, we're waiting for the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer to come and then he will reset the world and he'll do it perfectly and he's going to reign in righteousness the Bible and the knowledge of God will be all over the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's the great reset we're looking for. That's how we build back better, not through some politician, not so through some ungodly group of corporations, but through the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you know, Our duty is simply to be faithful. Our duty is simply to let God do his job. And you and I get on with doing our work. I was reading just today of the time of the Reformation. Bishop Hugh Latimer was uh, a bishop in the Anglican Church of England. And the King Henry asked him to come and preach to him. In the end, Hugh Latimer would actually be burned at the stake for his uncompromising stand for the truth. But when Hugh Latimer was preaching to the king, it was considered a great honor. And people said to him, be careful what you say to King Henry because he doesn't like being told he's wrong. Certainly doesn't like to be told he's an immoral man, which he was, grossly immoral man. Hugh Latimer went to stand before the king and preach. And as he stood up, he was aware of all these different opinions and threats against him. And he said this in his sermon, Latimer, Latimer, be careful what you are saying, for King Henry is listening to you this morning. And then to the shock of those who are listening, he went on to say this, Latimer, Latimer, be careful what you say, for the King of Kings is listening this morning. Well, that's so true, isn't it? God is a God of holiness, holiness, holiness. Never forget he's a holy God. Never forget he judges sin, but never forget he'll do it in his time and in his way. Just be faithful wherever you are. May God bless you and keep you. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for this story. Uh, In many respects, a horrific story. A story that we almost recoil from some of the details. It's so graphic. But then the Bible warns us that sin is a terrible thing and it brings terrible consequences and it invokes terrible judgments from God. And hell is a terrible place. A place that the Bible describes is a place of torment, eternal torment. Help us, Lord, to pray for the lost. Help us, Lord, to evangelize the lost. Help us, Lord, to be faithful and true to the lost and telling them that God's a God of grace and love, but also a God of judgment. 
May we remind ourselves of that as we seek to walk holy lives. But these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.